Good evening. On behalf of my colleagues and central office staff, I'd like to welcome you to the Shrewsbury School Committee meeting of February 13th, 2019. Our meeting tonight is being televised thanks to the work of Mr. John McDonald and the Shrewsbury Media Connection. This meeting will be rebroadcast on Channel 29 until our next regularly scheduled meeting on February 27th. It will also be available for viewing on SMC's website. Before we begin our agenda this evening, I would like to ask for a moment of silence and memory of two Shrewsbury educational leaders we have lost since our last meeting. Dr. John P. Collins served as superintendent of Shrewsbury Public Schools from 1978 to 1994 and was a transformational figure for the district. Mrs. Ellen Myers served the district in a number of roles, including as assistant principal at the high school and as the district's director of special education. Please join me in a moment of silence and memory of Dr. Collins and Mrs. Myers. Thank you. The first item on our agenda is public participation. Public participation provides an opportunity for members of the community to address the school committee and is at the top of our agenda at each regular meeting. Tonight, no one has expressed interest in addressing the committee. Those wishing to do so in the future should contact the chairperson in advance of the meeting and you will be recognized for up to three minutes. The next item on the agenda is chairpersons and members reports. Colleagues, anything to report? Seeing none, the next item on our agenda is superintendent's report, Dr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mr. Palich. Uh, first, let me add my uh, condolences uh, on the loss of uh, Dr. John Collins and uh, Ms. Ellen Myers. Um, they were both uh, wonderful leaders for the school district. Uh, certainly knew Dr. Collins well, although I didn't have the opportunity to work with him. Um, and the impact he had on this district as a leader is, is still felt today in many ways. Uh, and he was a, a consummate educator. Uh, Ellen Myers, I did have the, the privilege of working with for a number of years. Uh, both as a fellow assistant principal uh, as well as uh, a principal when she was the director of special education um, and she was uh, an outstanding leader who did uh, really excellent work uh, for students i think uh, uh, the, the fact that both of them uh, were fierce advocates for students uh, were uh, very much not only uh, led with uh, brilliant minds but with huge hearts um, and they certainly had a lot to do with forming the the culture that we uh, still have today that serves uh, students well um, in the community well uh, and their great losses uh, and we certainly send all of our condolences to their families um, of course including Patrick Collins uh, Dr. Collins son uh, some of the excellent work that our students do continues on uh, we're very pleased to report a variety of things happening in our schools uh, that represent um, the best of what our, our school district's about uh, this uh, just yesterday we had our annual black history month assembly uh, the black history committee uh, of uh, high school students did an outstanding job uh, it was a combination of speaking multimedia presentations dance uh, singing uh, poetry uh, as well as uh, 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 mu uh, musical performances as well uh, all on the theme of unity uh, and it really was uh, an outstanding uh, presentation that really focused and, and uh, was very touching in, in many ways relative to the contributions of uh, African Americans uh, over the history of our country. Uh, in addition, uh, yesterday and today was the annual science fair at Shrewsbury High School um, in that uh, uh, we had uh, some outstanding projects I was able to attend yesterday, um, really sophisticated research projects as you've seen from time to time over the years um, uh, that students as part of their research methods classes and some who choose to do it on their own. Um, and we'll know soon which students are moving on to the district level at WPI. Uh, we also have had several students recognized recently, uh, both in the performing arts and speech and debate. Uh, we had a number of students selected at the high school level for the Allstate uh, music uh, competition. We'll send those names out via uh, the listserv. Um, the uh, central district, many students from the middle school level were, were qualified for that level. Uh, we also had a visual arts uh, uh, competition at Anna Maria College that happens annually. We had a num number of students recognized um, and we had a record number of students qualify for nationals in one of the uh, qualifying speech and debate tournaments. Um, so lots of students continue to do excellent work and uh, uh, very pleased to, uh, to see these other examples beyond the day-to-day -day classroom work our students are doing to represent our community. Um, and that is Superintendent's report this evening. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. The next item on our agenda is a time scheduled appointment with the Shrewsbury High School eSports State Champions. Uh, in its inaugural year, the eSports program at SHS generated a tremendous amount of interest and multiple teams were formed. One team advanced to compete at the MSAA League of Legends on January 28th. 
and the SHS Gatekeepers team finished as the Fall 2018 Esports Champions. Team representatives are here with us tonight to talk about their successful season and their state championship win. I'll turn it over to Mr. Bazillo, who will introduce the team to us. Great, so thanks for having us tonight. It's, uh, like you told me last year, we've been sitting before you with uh, a member, uh, four members of our Esports team, right? Shrewsbury High School even having an Esports team and then capturing the state championship. Um, I didn't envision this at all. Uh, this fall, to give a little background, this fall, the MSSA put out a call for uh, all schools in the Commonwealth, particularly secondary schools, to try and identify students who might be interested in playing uh, eSports. And they, I think what they've seen is a, uh, the economy of uh, online gaming and also streaming. So uh, they put it out there. There's a company called Play VS out, out in California that partnered with the MSSA. Uh, and as a result, I believe we had 34 school districts participate in it, up to 60-something <coughs> teams, uh, and they worked through the fall. Uh, we, we initially put out a survey to garner interest, and we had over 100 responses, so we knew we were onto something right away. Um, and I believe we had a, approximately between 40 and 40 and 50 students participate actively throughout the, the fall. I'm going to let each member of the team introduce themselves. They'll introduce themselves. Uh, say what year they are, and then I'll let them talk a little bit about their season, how the structure of the season uh, went. The game is called League of Legends we played. Um, some of the audience and the viewing audience might know it, uh, but it requires a lot of skill, strategy, teamwork, collaboration. They truly play as a team, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about our experience down at Gillette Stadium for the state championship. So I'll turn it over to Tommy. So uh, my name is Tommy Wang, and I'm the captain of the team, and I'm also a senior. I'm Jerry Dew. I'm a junior. Uh, my name is Jerry Dang. I'm a senior. Uh, my name is Zach Morell, and I'm a junior. So basically, esports is like a normal sport that you would see, but it's online. Uh, as shown in the picture, this is where we played. And before I talk uh, any more, I'd like to thank the school administration and MSAA for the opportunity we've been given to play, because seeing that this is the first year this, that this has ever happened, it's incredible and it's amazing. And we did bring home the state championship. So it's pretty nice to see that. And um, so we did play the game League of Legends and we had a total of 20 teams playing. So each team consists of five players and we are against another set of uh, five players on this online battlefield. And the goal is pretty much to destroy their base, which is the objective. And so we had a total of 20 players, and then we also had substitutes for each team. Each team had about two to three substitutes, and the records for the teams uh, as follows is 10 and 2 for our team, the gatekeepers. We also had team DHU, which went 7 and 5, team NPG, which went 7 and 5, and also team TMA, which went 7 and 5. That was for the regular season, which was for about three to four weeks. And then after that, we... Fortunately, all made it to playoffs, and the playoffs matches, we went 5-0, and which won us the state championships. Uh, DHU went 1-1, one and one, MPG went 0-1, and, and TMA went 3-1. TMA went 0-1, and MPG oh, yeah, that, went 3-1. Sorry, about that. But um, as shown in the next slide, we did play at the Gillette Stadium in a showcase live. So we were basically on the right-hand side, and Newton South High School was on the left-hand side. And they're a pretty tough opponent, but we managed to go two and one against them in the best of three match. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. for those that don't know, if you're looking at that stage, each one of those uh, <coughs> these are really high-end computers, but there's a, a a panoramic screen there. But on top of the panor panoramic screen is also a camera, which they live stream through Twitch, which is a social media <coughs> site, which actually uh, streams all over the world. Um, and we were one of the featured events for that evening. And, and I think um, if you see there's a little divider between, team, between teams, so you can't look at what's happening on each, <laughs> the strategy of each team. But there's also, if you look to the far right, there's another screen. There's three screens basically set up at, at the stadium or at uh, Showcase Live. Long story short is they started playing the games with a three-minute delay. So there's no, uh, you can't live stream through Twitch while you're playing to try and find out the strategy of people. So was, uh, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> with this group of guys, this uh, and Barista Rosari, who was on the team as well. So uh, I learned a lot watching this. I think um, I was impressed uh, when they sat down, put on soundproofed headphones, uh, and you hear Tommy screaming more than anyone else on yeah. the team. But there was some strategy involved. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that uh, 
from the other folks on the team. So, as regards to strategy during the season, the nature of a lot of online games right now is you are able to understand your opponent through data recorded by the company that you have access to through various sites. So, during the regular season, by using the username of all of our opponents, which was listed through Group IDs, we were able to, in effect, scout the other teams without mm -hmm. having played them before and learn some of their strategies, what they were going to try to throw at us, be ready for all that, and also find out what their strongest assets were because at the beginning of each game there's a band phase in which each team has three bands each and then you each get three picks and then two more bands each and then the last two picks for each team. And in that band phase, if they had one specifically strong champion, we could target it and alleviate that sort of pressure on our team to not have to face their most practice or best strategy. And that would just be the pre-match, basically, efforts. But in the game, it was also a whole other ball game. You had different positions laid out for each person on the team. And for the subs, many of them had to fill in multiple positions. Tristan, who was our sub, played, I think, four positions this year. So it was necessary to have some flexibility in that <coughs> regard. But in each of the positions, you have your own responsibility, and you have to accomplish different things to meet your goal and help your team succeed. And to do so, you can't do it alone. It almost always requires teamwork and collaboration, which is part of the reason it was so successful this year, because it went off the idea of teamwork and collaboration between students instead of simply just raw mechanical skill, which was something that a lot of people at first glance might think this would be about. So it was really good on the MSAA and play these to choose a game like League of Legends, League of Legends that focus so much on teamwork rather than individual prowess. So we talk about 21st century skills and we talk about <coughs> teamwork and communicating. Clearly, this the members of this five team did a really fantastic job throughout the season. Interestingly, interestingly enough, both uh, two of our four teams that competed this year ended up in the semifinals. We were hoping for a Shrewsbury versus Shrewsbury final, but that didn't happen, <laughs> which would have been nice. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, when we traveled to Gillette, uh, the team went down early. I think we set up, I think you set up around 3, 30, 4 o'clock, and then they had a technical glitch, which delayed the match for about, what, two hours? Two hours, yeah. About two hours. We were in a waiting period for a 1 in 500,000 server glitch or whatever they described. So it was like an 40 minutes or something of us on stage. <laughs> there's like a 30 minute pause allowment for the game because if there is a technical issue and you can quickly resolve it, any team has access to the command slash pause during the game. So you can pause play, delay it, get the issue resolved and go back. But there's a 30 minute limit on it. So you can't use it strategically or be malicious with it. And we went through that entire 30 minute limit of pausing going off and on between we're playing again, then it's immediately paused was quite frustrating. So. It, was a, it was a long <laughs> night. Uh, <laughs> most most um, state championship matches uh, in traditional athletics might be a two, two and a half, three hour endeavor, maybe four with travel. Um, they were at Gillette Stadium for six hours minimal. Uh, I think we finished, it was about 10, 10, a little after 10 o'clock when we yeah. finally completed the match. So. Uh, it was, pretty, it was really outstanding. I think a uh, big shout out to Steve McKintry, who's our coach. He's also our IT specialist. He uh, coordinated and was a former player of League of Legends, or at least knew the lingo, unlike the principal or seemingly anyone in the <laughs> high school that's not gaming. But these, uh, uh, these young men are fantastic, uh, and their teammates were outstanding throughout the season. Um, I picked the trophy on the way over here. This is the trophy they received. It's a tr traditional trophy that would be much like they'd receive if it was uh, basketball or soccer or whatever it is. Um, and we also, you might have seen this in either Mr. Nevada or Mr. Lazat, who also attended the event, uh, or Mrs. McKinstry were posting on Twitter. Um, 
the picture of the state championship. That's Mr. McKinstry on the left, who's a coach. So these guys will answer any questions you, you might have. Excellent. Well, congratulations. <coughs> and colleagues, questions and comments? <laughs> Mrs. Gonzano. Um, congratulations. What a, what a, a marvelous achievement. Um, for those of us who don't know a lot about gaming, could you give me an example of what teamwork and collaboration looks like in real time or maybe a, a, your championship game? So around, like, in our championship game, uh, we won the first game, like, very easily, but then the second game, they came in with a new strategy that, like, we, we weren't used to, okay. and then we, we basically lost that game because we weren't communicating very well. But the most important part was after that, the second game, which was the loss, was we went back to a room, we discussed what went wrong, and then we were able to make up a strategy or uh, make up make up a strategy to pick better and like communicate well with each other to like figure out how to defeat their strategy because most likely they're going to try it again, and we we managed to win the state champions with the third game. Yeah. So typically, typically within a game, there is an IGL, which is an in-game leader, which usually does the shot calling. But our team, we do have one, which is me. But everyone also consists of adding in uh, talk and communicating. And within a split second, while we're probably doing a fight with the other team, uh, we would hurry and discuss really, really quickly while we're fighting what we would do, what our next steps would be, so that we would maintain that we're at least three to five steps ahead of the enemy team to guarantee like a, a huge lead against them and stuff. Like what's important is what I see <coughs> on my screen is not the same as what others see on their screen. So it's important for me to call out what, what like the others are doing and then make sure everyone's on the same page. And That's right. well, another thing is sometimes you see something that somebody else didn't see. Like there's an ability that nearly everybody runs in this game that's technically optional. It's called flash. and it's an instantaneous repositioning tool, and it's very important because it's on a five-minute cooldown, and the games <coughs> last from 30 to 40 minutes usually. So, like when they use that, if you see it and can call it out, you can capitalize on it, and it's a really big moment in the game. And there's things like these that you have to communicate to your teammates because mm -hmm. it can change how you attack a situation. And also, touching on the state championship. Basically, after the first game, we didn't make any changes, whereas Newton <coughs> saw what worked for us and the shortcomings of their own team and crafted around that, yeah. trying to basically tear apart what we had done and force us onto something different while trying to utilize what they had originally planned better. And from the second game to the third game, in that transition, we basically did the same thing looked at what would work for them. We changed our original three bands from <coughs> which had stayed constant through game one and two. We kept one of them and changed the other two to specific champions that were a problem in the second game that led to that loss. So from that strategic aspect, it was very important to understand as a team what went wrong and how to fix it, to be able to communicate that. And like Tommy said with the in-game leader, you have an in-game leader, which for the most part can be responsible for your macro calls, but individual players and individual situations, they're not always involved and might not always have the best perspective on the fight, so you have to be able to quickly and efficiently communicate with your teammates. It usually goes to short bursts or words that you can both understand. A lot of the times it would be calling out a specific <coughs> person you want to target because they're the biggest threat to you in that fight or some other variation like we should do this, we should do this, mm -hmm. or attack this guy, go for dragon, do an objective quickly and decisively. And it's really important that everybody stays on the same page during those times and <coughs> nobody goes off by themselves because if you do that, you put your team at a disadvantage if the other team shows up with all their people. I just, wanna, you know, oh, sorry. I just want to add that um, League of Legends is a game that requires a lot of flexibility because you have to learn how to play in different ways. Otherwise, if you only know how to play one way and you face an enemy team over several games, they can easily adapt to how you play and abuse that, causing you to like do really bad and thus losing for your team.
Yeah, so in the game, there's 140 different characters that you can play. And each character has a set of different abilities, which consists of four abilities. So you always have to know how to counter your enemy because they can choose one, one of 140. And then you'd have to learn off of that. So everyone <coughs> on the enemy team can choose out of 140 champions. And if you don't know each of the four abilities on their champion, and a lot of times it comes with a passive as well because each champion has a unique passive that's not a button press but exists in the game and assists their champion. If you can't understand all of them and their advantages and their weaknesses, it's very difficult and you basically play from a disadvantage. I think they just explained how they won. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's outstanding. You just blew me all away. Thank you so much. Mrs. Fritz. A uh, question. What part in the season do you find out the game that you're going to have? Is it one game for the whole season? How does that work? Because you must have to practice with this particular game. Yeah, so when the season started, it was in the beginning of the regular season. We had three to four weeks, I believe. Uh, each week we played against two different teams, mm -hmm. one at 4 p.m., one at 6 p.m. We would have to stay at school. Um, we would know roughly a week beforehand or a couple of days beforehand which team we're against. Mm -hmm. So that's when Jack Doyle, who's our in-game scouter, he would check out all the team's players and mm -hmm. check all their statistics and how they play and stuff like that. Google everyone. Yeah, and then we play against them. How many hours a week do you think you practice? This is, that's a lot of... I don't think... I think it would concern parents. If that's what I was <laughs> 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 Just give it an hour. Oh, you have a trophy a there, so obviously yeah. it's not all <laughs> a problem. But I would expect it's, you have to put a significant amount of time. It's definitely greater than the number that people in sports like basketball, football, mm -hmm. like, have to practice with them. Thank you. Well, yeah. you have the opportunity to practice more than them. It's not necessarily a necessary requirement, and a lot of times it's more efficient to do so in a scrim environment and playing with your team because then you establish communication and synergy along with individual practice. Mm -hmm. But because it's not a physical exercise as much as basketball practice or football practice or soccer practice would be, <coughs> you have the ability to go for longer and develop more in less time because you don't have the necessary required rest and recuperation from physical sports. Yeah, interesting. So that can be an advantage, but it can also be... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wesky, I had a question about prep time as well, because I can imagine there's a lot that goes into it. And uh, So did you scout Newton South, like, in advance? Is that... Yes. Okay. That was where our original three bands came from. Yeah. Were against their specific strategies were from what we have learned online about their specific players, right. what they've played in previous games, yeah. and all the accumulated <coughs> data to figure out what they could possibly throw at us and be ready for it. And is that, you don't have to say the number of hours, but is, is that like an everyday after school thing leading up to the, the uh, tur tournament? Or? Actually, the way they lay it out is not as complicated as it sounds, because like we said originally, there's 140 champions. Right. For the most part, you don't get much of their stats in a meaningful way other than basically what champion they played or did they win or lose, how well they did. Sure. Mm -hmm. So most of it is tying that to a champion, figuring out what their best ones are, and being prepared for those. Right. Yeah, most people like to specialize in around one to three people. So when we look it up, like it only takes like 10 minutes to figure out their whole roster, what they're good at, and find out like 10 to 15 champions they're good at sure. and figure out the most problematic to be for what plan we want to execute and ban, ban accordingly. And then for the amount of hours spent a day, um, to give like a small estimation, I think most players spend at least three hours a day playing. <laughs> that would be a challenge. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm much greater than that, but for some, the minimum is three players. And um, about the scouting, even though our other three teams were eliminated during playoffs, they were also a very big help to us because they also previously played against teams like Newton South. Yeah. So it's even better than just like on paper statistics because they could tell us how they actually played and what we could do to counter it like specifically. Specifically because we were in the computer room we showed earlier on the <coughs> screen when we were both playing the semifinals because that was not at a LAN event. It was at from online at your school. We finished our games quickly and me and both Jerry's were able to watch the remainder of the last game fully for Noon South 
where MPG played them in the semifinals, we were able to basically scout them live in a game for its entire duration, and that was really <coughs> helpful to seeing what their biggest strategies were. Specifically, one of the champions that we saw was Rengar, and that's not going to give much information because unless you know the game, but it was specific to my opposite number, and it was his best champion and strategy, and we banned it for the first two games, but were forced to drop it in favor of a different ban in the last game, and thus we had to face their biggest strength in the last game, but we deemed it as less effective than the, what they had played before, and it was these give and take scenarios that you were forced into in which you are forced to agree upon a decision and be able to work through that decision. And you might have mentioned this is one of the questions. Uh, is the first eSports high school champion in Massachusetts, right? Was there, were there previous? No. No, it's the first one. Right. So we have another, <coughs> excuse me, we have another fall, uh, spring season uh, starting. The deadline's been extended a little <coughs> bit to see what we're going to uh, determine if we're going to play. There's actually offering three games. League of Legends is one of the most popular games in the world. Um, so I think they chose a game that had multiple, that relied on teamwork, collaboration, flexible thinking, uh, the scouting piece and the preparation. Clearly, they we did all that. Um, but there's three other games. I think we're trying. We did a survey. We're going to try and focus on one of the two this this spring and do another, maybe do spring season with just one game. Um, you also have to understand that they just don't play video games. They're they're very involved in our school com community. They've done other things besides play video games and come to Shrewsbury High School. They, didn't, they don't give themselves enough credit for what they've done, but they're in other co-curricular programming than just this. So um, they're fantastic young men, and, uh, and, and they've been, it, was a great, it was a great experience for all of us. And as a principal I, uh, and the administrative team at the high school <coughs> was really trying to figure out a way that we can try and engage all students. We knew this is a big piece that students are playing this outside of school. We figured out how can we bring something in to you know, provide more opportunity for students at the high school. Uh, and this seemed like a great fit for us for the fall. Colleagues, anything further? Uh, just a, a quick Go question. Ahead, Sarah, I, I'm <clears throat> completely uninitiated to this whole thing, needless to say. Um, are, are there any online videos or anything where we could kind of see one of these games and get a sense as to... Uh, the the whole match is actually archived. Everything <laughs> on the Internet is archived. Whatever you post, as you know, we tell our students, whatever you post on the Internet, you can find. You could find it through Twitch. T-W-I-T-C-H, which is the online provider or the online streaming, um, and you just have to Google the Massachusetts Esports Championship. The match is, it'll show you about four hours. There's actually, there was three men from uh, Twitch who are no, no, unknown to me and probably all of you that are popular within the esports circle actually at the event commentating on the players live. <laughs> So they're streaming their live. It's like it was like you'd see the Super Bowl with um, Tony Romo and Jim Nance. There's two 20 somethings, maybe 30 somethings, young 30, late 20s, 30 somethings, commentating the entire strategy of the game. Believe me, I didn't understand half what they were saying, but uh, watching the score and how it happened, and Mr. McKinstry pointing out the things that are happening to me and uh, Mr. Nevada and Mr. Lazat was helpful. So we could cheer them on. But it was, a, it was a great venue. The MSAA did a great job of securing a great venue. Um, it was a little bit cumbersome for us to get down there, but um, we certainly can do that. I'm not sure if, I think it's a whole, the whole game stream. I don't think they have the highlights, but it looks the highlights. Yeah, it was the entire VOD. Of the, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any idea how many viewers there were? Uh, not oh. much. <clears throat> Roughly 100. We could check throughout, and it was, it was floating around 80 for the majority of the yeah, matches, right. and there were probably different people on and off, so probably about 100 net. Colleges and universities are actually moving toward uh, esports teams. If you, this is another trend that's happening at post secondary education where they're actually <coughs> offering scholarships and recruiting students in esports. Yeah. Um, so recruiters were and have contacted people based upon their rank, based upon their skill level. Uh, an interest to potentially try and woo students to come to their school. So, yeah. So I know that the um, president slash coach <coughs> of the UMass Amherst League of Legends team was also watching the stream for Jerry and I, since we're the two seniors that may potentially go to UMass Amherst. Jerry so, has well. connections. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. New world for me. It is. <laughs> <laughs>
Dr. One, McGee. One last question. Is this primarily a, a uh, activity that appeals to young men, or are there young women who participate as well? Um, Actually, one of the, sorry, the, one of the players on our team, uh, her name is Verissera. She was in the picture, I in the last picture. She's on the left next to Coach McKinstry. She was mm -hmm. one of our primary players that helped us. And she was actually a very important player who helped us win the state championship. But typically, there's more uh, men that play this game, more males. But there also are females that also play mm -hmm. video games. Thanks. Hmm. Colleagues, further questions or comments? Dr. Sawyer, anything you wanted to add? just want to thank you. It's uh, been an education for me as well. And uh, it's from time to time you see something in the news or somewhere in the media about the popularity of esports and video gaming and, and uh, or these Twitch network and things. That, and, and the I always have to do a double take on the numbers, the number of people who are involved, the amount of money that's involved. Um, this is an entire industry. I know we've seen you know some local colleges and universities as well as those nationally who are starting to create – uh, majors in gaming. Uh, you know, there's, I know when I talk to students at the high school, sometimes what they're interested in doing is video game design um, in terms of their uh, uh, future potential uh, profession. Uh, and I guess I'd be curious, is there in, in terms of what you might know you're thinking about for next year or, or the future when you, when you head off beyond Shrewsbury High School, uh, any thoughts in terms of what field of study or anything that this might be? Is there something about this experience that's pointing you in a certain direction of what you might want to do uh, beyond, in, in addition to potentially professional League of Legends gameplay? <laughs> well, I can say that three of the four people here, me, Jerry, and Jerry, are on the robotics team at Shrewsbury. And all of us probably are going towards some form of computer related or engineering related fields, likely. and because of the nature of those fields and how they're tied into progressive technology, it, we're inherently close to the growth of online gaming because it's the community we have a lot of interest in and have a lot of connections with. And a lot of our friends and peers also do it as well. It's a very easy and efficient way to play and have fun with your friends without physically having to get a ride to their house or going somewhere. So it's a lot more accessible in that way. But in terms of whether this will influence my career choices specifically, probably not necessarily influencing my career choices, but that is no takeaway from the idea of it because it was incredibly fun and I will return to it if it is still ongoing in our school this next season. So directly it didn't lead me to a different career, but it helped me along a new experience and new path and gave me opportunities to go to Gillette, play with a team, learn communication skills with friends and peers. And that's remarkable to be able to get something like that from such a looked down upon, in many ways, group. Well, I, I would suggest that, you know, when I, we think about some of the work we're trying to do, and robotics team is another great example of these kinds of things that we're trying to create, regardless of what specific field of study or profession students end up going into. Um, when we talk about the four C's of 21st century learning, whether that's critical thinking, collaboration, communication, even creativity, um, this hits them all in, in some way. And I would imagine if you end up going into an engineering field or a computer field, um, the kinds of things that you did to make this, these are all team-based professions uh, to some degree. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me that these experiences are going to be very valuable regardless of what you do going forward. So congratulations again. Uh, we're very proud of the work you've done. And uh, it's uh, historic in that the first ever uh, state champions in eSports are coming from Shrewsbury High School. Um, so with that, if you gentlemen would like to come up and shake the committee's hand, and we've got a certificate for you. And uh, again, congratulations.
Oh, nice shot. Congratulations. Well done. Congratulations. And we'll get the other two. We'll get the other two to the other two players. Congrats. Scouting the game. Excellent. The next item on our agenda this evening is under policy. It is a discussion of the school year proposed calendar for the 2019-2020 season. This is a first reading. Dr. Sawyer will summarize the proposed calendar, which is enclosed committee members in our meeting materials, and answer any questions the committee may have. The draft calendar will then be posted for public comment in advance of an anticipated vote at our next meeting on February 27th. Dr. Sawyer. Thank you. Uh, you may recall that a few years ago we uh, reconvened a calendar committee of uh, parents and staff members. Um, the, the calendar since then has reflected the recommendations of that committee in a variety of ways, and this uh, calendar uh, continues to do that. It's very similar um, to the calendar we've had the last few years, um, as been, has been the case uh, going on at least two decades uh, and since I've been here in, in Shrewsbury. Uh, the intent is to begin the school year. Uh, the week prior to Labor Day, uh, the last week of August, uh, with that Monday uh, being the first day for staff, that Tuesday being a, a school day for students, first day. Um, that would be the th three days, that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, for students to be in session. Uh, and then the Friday prior to Labor Day would be a non-school day for students, uh, but would be a professional development day uh, for staff. That's been a, a seemed to have worked with good timing for initiatives that uh, we want to make sure we're rolling out at the first part of the school year. Um, it gives a four-day weekend after the intensive opening for students, and then we resume uh, with a nice stretch, long stretch of time up until uh, Columbus Day weekend, which we also have another Friday Professional Development Day. Um, and that was the feedback from parents to that committee was uh, tying full professional development days to weekends, uh, with long weekends whenever possible. Uh, beyond that, the, the one change from the current year, although this is something, we did something similar uh, back in uh, two years ago, uh, traditionally, uh, we've held the uh, parent conference day for grades pre-K through 8 uh, on election day in November um, for two reasons. Timing-wise, it's a good uh, point in the year to have those conferences, uh, but also because uh, Coolidge School and Spring Street School are still uh, voting locations. Uh, and, and the November elections, when they're held, are, are quite large. Uh, that helps us with managing that situation. Uh, however, there's no uh, election in November this year. Uh, uh, Veterans Day uh, actually falls on Monday, um, and after some conversation with the administrative team, we've also run this by our, our district faculty advisory council, and also as uh, uh, the leadership of the teachers association and the paraprofessional association. Uh, the recommendation that I have at this point is to uh, have that one week later than typical uh, and connect it with Veterans Day, so it would be on Tuesday, November 12th. Um, there were some questions a couple of years ago whether or not we might have a lot of families traveling during that time and not have as many people come in for conferences, but it really wasn't the case. Um, and we, we anticipate that will be a, a good connection again. Uh, at the high school, that's actually a professional development day, so there are no conferences, so parents will only have high school students. Um, they can utilize that time, or students can. Some, that's a time of year sometimes uh, seniors may be traveling to look at colleges. Um, so we thought that was good to connect it to the existing holiday. Um, Beyond that, uh, the, the, as we continue through the year, uh, we have a series of Tuesdays, which is our traditional staff meeting day, uh, that will be early release days, um, so we can capture, uh, connect uh, longer blocks of three hour periods of time for staff professional development. Uh, the traditional three day November vacation, uh, the December vacation, uh, because of uh, travel and the way it falls, so the idea would be to actually begin that at the end of the day on December 20th. Uh, the week of uh, Monday, December 23rd uh, would be off, and then students would return, as is traditionally on the 2nd of January after that break, uh, the day after New Year's Day. And then beyond that, it's the traditional, uh, typical uh, state federal holidays and uh, uh, the February vacation, the week of President's Day, and the April vacation, the week of Patriot's Day, uh, with uh, uh, the continued, folk, uh, the continued uh, tradition of having high school graduation um, the week of Memorial Day uh, with all the senior events that week. Um, so, uh, and you know, one of the benefits, uh, this has been uh, going on well over probably 12, close to 15 years now, um, by starting before uh, Labor Day um, and by not having some of the uh, holidays that some other districts choose to take relative to uh, uh, faith holidays, depending on the, the population in different communities, whether those are the Jewish holidays or whether that's uh, Good Friday uh, in the Christian faith um, or uh, some of the conversations we have with the uh, 
committee a few years ago was about whether or not other holidays like uh, Diwali or Eid uh, for the Hindu and the Muslim faith, respectively. Um, and that was something actually the calendar committee that convened about 15 years ago or so uh, had taken up as the community became more diverse um, to look at as more and more holidays came into it, handling those by being sensitive and respectful of families whose students won't be attending those days, uh, but not having no school days that would extend the year uh, deeper into June. Um, under this calendar, the last day, barring any snow days, uh, would be Friday, June 12th, uh, which gives us uh, pretty much a full week potential for five snow days before we get into our traditional summer Institute of Professional Development, uh, the last full week in June. Um, so that's an overall summary of the proposed calendar. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee has at this point. And as Mr. Palich mentioned, we will post it on our website. Um, and any feedback that the community uh, wishes to give, uh, we'll certainly forward that. And they can send it directly to you at your email address or through me. Um, and we would ask for a vote for approval um, at your next meeting on February 27th. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Colleagues, questions or comments? Seeing none, we will, as Dr. Sawyer and I have mentioned, this will be posted online, and we certainly invite, <coughs> excuse me, we certainly invite members of the public to offer their feedback prior to our next meeting. The next item on our agenda is also under policy. It is in regard to the enrollment of non-resident students policy that was revised actually at a previous business meeting. This is a housekeeping matter to clean up some language in the policy that we revised again just at our previous meeting. Uh, this the second reading of a draft of a revised policy 621, which is the enrollment of non-resident pupils, was held at the meeting on January 23rd, and the committee voted to approve the draft with the stipulation that the phrase parent or guardian was to be used in place of family or guardian simply for the purposes of being consistent in the language that we use. Uh, I later determined, with the assistance of our clerk, Ms. McCollum, that the motion that I made did not do quite what we had intended, so I asked that it come back before the committee tonight so that we can correct that oversight. There is a slightly revised version of that policy in committee members' materials uh, that makes the requested changes so that the phrase parent or guardian or the plural thereof is as appropriate, is used in place of the terms family, families, parent, or parents, again, just to ensure consistency of language. Uh, and again, an updated draft that incorporates those changes is reflected in our materials. Colleagues, any questions or comments? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the updated policy 621 enrollment of non-resident pupils as presented in our materials. So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. The next item on our agenda is the a discussion of the fiscal 2020 budget. The superintendent's recommendation, Dr. Sawyer and Mr. Collins, will present the superintendent's initial recommendation for the FY 2020 school department budget. I'm going to ask my other administrator colleagues to join us as well. Excellent. So Dr. Sawyer, Mr. Collins, Ms. Malone, Ms. Clowder, Ms. Belsito, welcome. So good evening, uh, and for those watching uh, at home to my left, uh, Mr. Patrick Collins is our Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, and to my right, Meg Belsito is Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, uh, which includes Special Education and Pupil Personnel Services, uh, Amy Clowder, uh, who is our Assistant Superintendent uh, for Curriculum Instruction and, Asse and Assessment, um, and Ms. Barb Malone, who is our Director of Human Resources. Um, the five of us are essentially the district-level administrative team uh, for the district. Um, certainly want to, before we begin, uh, thank them for their many efforts uh, on this uh, work to present this budget to you this evening, um, as well as uh, the team of, of principals, other district leaders, assistant principals, and department directors, uh, and also particularly uh, Kim Fitzpatrick, uh, who is uh, Mr. Collins' primary uh, support in, uh, in the business office, and she was uh, very much responsible for the, uh, the yellow budget book that are part of your materials. Uh, this year, uh, you know, just in the presentation, uh, we will uh, cover a number of major topics, uh, and they're just listed here just to orient you. We're going to talk a little bit about how we're changing our process this year, um, as well as talking about what we have for a status quo budget, where some of these funds come from. Uh, we're going to talk some what our finances look like and, and enrollment, uh, state aid. Uh, what we look at is some indicators of, of being cost effective uh, and providing value to the community. 
Um, and then we're going to uh, take a break at that point after we've talked about our status quo budget to give you an opportunity to ask any questions you have of that. Um, and then we'll shift gears into, and there's a little bit of the difference this year, um, talking about what our community's expectations are, have clearly that have been laid out over the past couple of years um, and, and how uh, we might uh, uh, meet those as we go through the rest of the budget season, uh, looking at a variety of uh, recommendations for strategic investments to meet the expectations the community has of us. Um, so that's what we'll take you through this evening and we look forward to your questions and comments. Uh, in terms of the process itself, uh, this is uh, partially in response to the fact that uh, those who have been paying attention to the uh, Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager, Mr. Mizikar, the Town Manager, in his second year uh, has shifted the way that uh, he is doing some of the budgeting work um, for the municipal budget and the overall town budget, of course, which includes the school department. Uh, and uh, we felt it was a good time for us to maybe shift gears a bit as well um, to match a little bit of how he's uh, approaching things. Um, one of those is that uh, the initial uh, recommendation he's making, we, we believe, uh, will be very close to probably what the eventual amount of, of funding uh, that the town will be able to move towards uh, the school department or invest in the school department. Uh, and uh, at the same time, because of the way we've been working with these, the strategic plan that was put into place a year ago by the school committee uh, for the school department, uh, trying to separate out, instead of putting everything together in one ask, uh, looking at you know, what we have that exists, what it takes to move that forward, um, and then looking at these four categories and what it is that we think uh, would, would be wise investments for the community to make in its schools um, in order to achieve the kinds of uh, goals and, uh, that, that, are, that have been laid out and expected of us over the next five years. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, especially for those who might be watching for the first time, uh, how school finance in Massachusetts works for public schools. Uh, Mr. Collins will take you some of that, uh, we'll, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the status quo budget uh, looks like uh, for our school district for next year. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So first, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, there are a variety of uh, funding sources that go into uh, supporting public education uh, in our community. And so I tried to lay it out in some form of uh, educational speak or ABCs. And so uh, first, um, the, the major source of our funding uh, on an annual basis is uh, the so-called general fund or local appropriation. That's the budget that we take to the annual town meeting and uh, ask for uh, their approval. Um, that, in fact, uh, uh, there's two underlying sources there for that general fund appropriation, and that's money that's provided by taxation or other uh, revenue sources that are generated by our community, and then also outside chap so-called Chapter 70 uh, state education aid. And it's really those two components that uh, form our general fund local appropriation. I'm going to unpack that a little bit more in some upcoming slides. Uh, but in addition to that funding source, uh, we also receive another form of state aid called special education circuit breaker money. And uh, this came into play uh, probably about 10 years or so ago, and that is uh, a funding f uh, source to assist communities who have uh, students who are receiving uh, special education services uh, at a very high cost and to provide some sort of relief. And so the concept is, is that when they reach a certain threshold of cost, the so-called circuit breaker switch flips, and then every dollar after that threshold um, there's some reimbursement from the state, you know, somewhere between 65 to 75 percent of those dollars beyond uh, that threshold. Uh, that threshold they, you know, they set at so-called four times the foundation budget, or it's kind of like an average cost per pupil. So, you know, it's about $45,000. So that first $45,000 the community owns, and then every dollar thereafter, uh, there is some uh, reimbursement in. Um, so. Anyway, there's lots of tracking and record keeping that's required to, to be done by the special education office. Uh, it's a very time consuming process uh, and uh, an annual claim that has to be submitted at uh, the end of each uh, school year. Um, it's a reimbursement for the prior year cost, so it's not you know forward looking, it's backward looking. Uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to that, but uh, all in all, it's, uh, you know, and you'll see in the, in the budget documents, that, that can range anywhere between 2.7 to 3.4 million dollars. So it's another important revenue source uh, 
for our uh, operations. Federal and state grants, uh, these are uh, typically federal grants are received by uh, almost every community in uh, Massachusetts and, and throughout the country, and depending on your student demographics, um, we receive you know, between 1.8 and $2 million of uh, federal aid, again, uh, primarily for uh, special education, uh, but also for uh, low income, uh, based upon your low income uh, student ratio, and that's for targeted reading and math services. Uh, and then state grants, uh, we receive actually in the last few years, zero dollars. Uh, so there's not a lot of state grant money uh, uh, to be had in our equation. <clears throat> That's in Shrewsbury. Uh, in terms of fee revenue, you know, uh, we are, uh, I would say, relatively, in comparison to other communities, a so-called high-fee district. We have lots of fees, you know, busing, uh, student activities, athletics, music lessons, uh, after-school care. Um, so uh, that generates an important revenue source uh, for us simply to offset costs for those specific programs. Uh, and, of course, those came into play difficult budget times, and it was done reluctantly by uh, school committees in, in, in the past in order to uh, maintain all of those very important co-curricular programs. And then there's private gifts and grants. Um, you know, we run the annual Colonial Fund uh, each year. We've had uh, the Road Scholars race in the past, and then more recently, uh, we had a, a capital campaign to fund the Turf Project. Uh, that raised over $2 million to install that turf field up at Shrewsbury High School um, through individual donations and corporate sponsorship. Uh, and then finally, F, student activity funds. And this is typically what parents are used to paying for <coughs> field trips or um, dances or things uh, like that to fund admission prices and uh, transportation to those events. So there's a lot of different funding sources that go into supporting our operation. This is uh, just a chart that shows kind of the relativity of all those different uh, types of funds. And the, the blue shaded uh, area is that town uh, local appropriation. And you can see uh, there uh, the other smaller funding sources. The, the blue part, of course, has the, the, the biggest rise of all of them. And the other funding sources have remained relatively flat over this time period, fiscal 14 to fiscal 20. Uh, that blue shaded area, the town appropriation back in fiscal 14 was $52 million. The proposal that you have for fiscal 20 is $67 million. So it's a $15 million increase in that particular funding source, while other areas have remained uh, relatively flat. Um, so if you were to take that blue portion that I just showed you there and subdivide that now, into two pieces, that local contribution that I spoke about earlier, and then the state aid, you can see, again, the distribution over the same time period, and the blue shaded area being Chapter 70 state aid. And for that time period, it's, it's increased by $1.1 million. And uh, the local contribution over that same time period, $13.9 million. So just going back here, the blue shaded area, like I said, went up $15 million, and that's the distribution. It's basically, you know, local revenues, uh, property tax revenue, uh, meals tax, um, motor vehicle excise tax, other types of uh, fees uh, and uh, taxes. So um, you can see where uh, that, you know, state aid, of course, we, we look a lot at state aid and what the governor's budget uh, is going to be and, and what... Uh, the state uh, legislature is going to do, uh, but in fact, <clears throat> you know, the, the, we need to look at ourselves really primarily uh, because that's where uh, the funding, new funding is going to come uh, into the future. Uh, also, um, another aspect uh, that uh, I wanted to just bring out is that beyond the school budget that we bring to town meeting, each of the other departments, of course, bring their own budgets, whether it's the police department, public buildings, um, town uh, treasurer's budget. They all have uh, pieces of their budget that, in fact, support school operations, like health and life insurance for our active employees and our retirees. That comes under the town treasurer's budget. Um, 
<coughs> retirement costs for school uh, retirees who are part of the town retirement system, uh, school resource officers from the police department, uh, building operations costs, heating, lighting, custodial services comes out of the public buildings department. But at the end of each year, uh, we get either from our accounting system or from those departments individually uh, the costs that uh, were incurred in support of uh, school operations. We're required to collect all this information, report it to the state. All of those things get factored into the average cost per pupil. Um, but you can see here from this bar chart that you know, those dollars from other budgets can range anywhere between $22 million to $25 million uh, on an annual basis. So with that, uh, the status quo budget that uh, is being presented to the school committee for consideration uh, is uh, for uh, a town appropriation of just over $67 million. Uh, that represents a $2.9 million uh, increase uh, over the current fiscal year. That represents a 4.59, almost 4.6% uh, increase. Um, you see on the bullets on this slide that the actual increases we've had over the last four years uh, range from 2.2% back in FY16, 2.83% last year, uh, the low 3% uh, percents in the uh, two years in between, uh, for an average of 2.9% of uh, over those four years. Um, now, those are the four years after we had a very significant increase of close to 10% uh, the year that the operational override came into effect. Um, and uh, I, I think, and you'll see later in the presentation, uh, we talk about you know, the initial request that came from the school department versus uh, what was actually funded, which is represented by these percentage increases, um, really shows that there's been some pent-up demand uh, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish and what we feel we need to accomplish, what we've been able to do. Uh, and certainly we've been in a much healthier place since the override, uh, but the piece that we have to be considerate of as a community is that um, if we're not able to meet that demand in an, in, in, in a, an environment where we're still growing as far as our enrollment, uh, that that's going to lead to uh, the kinds of uh, consequences that uh, we want, certainly want to avoid in terms of affecting the quality of education. Um, so that is the is the is what the request is for a status quo budget. Uh, the next slide shows uh, really kind of in a very broad sense uh, the four categories of what the percentage changes that make that up. Um, so of that um, essentially 4.6% increase, um, Salaries and wages is by far the largest part of our budget and for a status quo just to bring our existing staff forward to next year. Um, we see uh, that's estimated at 3.6%, uh, which is a very reasonable number uh, in terms of uh, this kind of uh, uh, public education uh, sector. Uh, transportation services are up significantly. That's a combination of the fact that we have a new contract uh, with AA Transportation that began this year. Uh, you may recall that uh, when they were the sole bidder, um, they act we were able to actually negotiate with them to limit the impact of year one and spread it across the first two years, the most significant increases. Uh, we also need to add a couple of buses, which is really a reflection of the fact that we continue to grow. Uh, some of that's for special education transportation and some of that's for general transportation in terms of meeting our students' needs. Um, it's a very, very efficient program already. Um, and we don't see a way forward to absorb the additional enrollment we've continued to have uh, without putting some additional vehicles on the road, uh, which obviously adds to that budget. Out of district tuitions for special education, um, and just by way of preview at your next meeting, uh, Ms. Belsita will do a uh, more detailed presentation around special education budget, uh, but this is, uh, as you know, uh, the most volatile. Uh, in terms of costs for year over year, depending on student needs, and, and the, these can be very high cost placements of, of students in specialized schools out of district. Uh, when they're necessary, uh, they're, they're, it's what we're, we're obligated and should be doing when it's the right thing to do, uh, but uh, they obviously have an impact uh, on the budget. Um, and then the circuit breaker Mr. Collins referred to, unfortunately, can be uh, unpredictable from year to year how much the state funds it. So that's a, a, one of the areas we have to monitor the most, the most closely over the next few months. Um, and then finally, materials, supplies, et cetera, contracted services, that's actually uh, in the status quo budget goes down about 1%. Uh, some of that's because our leasing program for our iPad program, our one-to-one -one technology program, um, hit a peak in the current fiscal year and is actually starting to come down to where we'll get to an equilibrium after that initial very big lease when we went to the high school all at once um, is phasing out. Uh, so that's, uh, those are the different drivers. The next, the next uh, slide actually shows uh, the, what I just uh, discussed. 
Um, and you can see there uh, some more details about uh, why those different percentages are increasing um, the way that they uh, the way that they are displayed in that previous table. The next uh, pie chart, uh, you can see very dramatically that by far uh, the greatest expense, uh, and that's no exception to any school department, is salaries. Uh, we're a, a human resources business. Um, and then the various other uh, slices of the pie, um, everything from transportation, special ed transportation, tuitions that we just mentioned, tuition to vocational technical high school at Assabet, uh, that's about 3% of our budget. Um, and then uh, you can see that, uh, again, the salaries are by far uh, the largest part. Um, and as I referenced earlier, enrollment uh, continues to be a driver as well. In the next slide, um, you can see that uh, we're, we're hit, we hit this past year a, a high of 6,258 students. Um, you can see that just since 2015, that's a 3.5% increase. And our, our budgetary resources have not been growing commensurately with the number of, um, some of those we can absorb through economy of scale, but we're seeing pressures in different places, particularly in enrollment at the high school um, that we have to be able to deal with. And that's actually shown by this next slide uh, where you can see that since 2002 when the high school opened, uh, this is, uh, we, we've increased by 739 students, which is larger than many high schools in central Massachusetts itself, just that increase of the 65% increase in students. We are packed to the gills there. Um, the high school administration is, is doing lots to mitigate the, the effects of that, and it, it's still a terrific experience for kids, uh, but it does have implications in terms of what we can provide when we're maximizing room space and what we might be able to do to be even more flexible with our schedule requires resources in the form of staff, particularly, and you'll see a request for this later on, uh, not having to share staff with the middle school level so that they can do things with their schedule that aren't dependent on another school schedule at the same time. Uh, another area we're experiencing uh, higher enrollment over time is in English language learners. Um, you can see that trend is up significantly uh, over the uh, last many years. Uh, Went down a bit this past year, uh, in year over year, that can be an unpredictable population of students, uh, but it does require mandated staffing resources uh, in order to provide what the state uh, legally uh, requires us to do for the education of students who need to learn English when they arrive here. Um, so that's something that is taken into consideration as well. <coughs> and Mr. Collins will speak briefly to the next uh, piece, which is around uh, class size, which of course has always been a priority of the school committee. So this, is, again, is, is a driver for our budget planning for the upcoming school years to take a look at uh, enrollment projections. Uh, you've seen an enrollment projection report already. You know, we look at uh, two different sources um, of projections, uh, and basically then we uh, calibrate or look at both of those and uh, forecast uh, on a school-by-school, grade-by-grade basis uh, what our expected class sizes are. You know, the, the more difficult part of this, uh, frankly, is the, the grade one, uh, because uh, not all of our uh, grade one students are in our district right now. As kindergartners, we get a large number, we get a big bump, about a 15% increase uh, in that kindergarten cohort going to grade one. And so it's really trying to determine, you know, what school elementary zones uh, that they're in. Um, so. Uh, and then we'll want to make sure that we have uh, class sizes that are in or close to school committee guidelines. And um, if, if you look at this distribution here, we look to be in very good shape and not having to add any uh, new teaching positions at the elementary level. And also uh, we're looking at <clears throat> of uh, 347 uh, projected kindergarten students, 243 of them, uh, would be in a full day kindergarten program. So that's uh, a pretty good number uh, of uh, there. Um, although we'd like to have all the students <coughs> full day kindergarten, certainly will when the Beale project comes online. So that's the elementary level. <coughs> At the secondary level, again, it's the same process. Um, we're able to get, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit better. Uh, more accurate projections because all the students in these grade levels are uh, in our district already. Uh, again, the guidance is 22 to 24. We're looking at averages right now at uh, grade 5 and 6 of 25, just slightly over, and uh, grade 8 at 26, again, a little bit over there, and uh, 24 is at grade 7. 
And of course, we're <coughs> maxed out for space at the middle schools as well. So we wouldn't really have the option to add a few more teachers into because we don't have the rooms to put them in. Um, but fortunately, we're staying pretty steady with just a, a slight, a, a slightly over the uh, class size uh, guidelines that we have from the school committee. So at this point, we're going to shift away from enrollment and talk about uh, the topic of state aid a little bit more. And um, this first slide shows a uh, reflection of uh, the, the governor's budget, which was uh, published in late January. And it shows that uh, inclusive, included in his budget is $20 uh, per student uh, in additional state aid uh, for fiscal 20, the upcoming fiscal year, school year 2019-2020, uh, with enrollment of just over 6,000 students, so it would be $120,860 more right now. Uh, that is uh, also factored into the town manager's uh, revenue projection, overall revenue projection for both uh, state aid and uh, local uh, resources. We are a so-called minimum aid uh, community, uh, meaning that uh, the only new state aid that we're going to get is uh, these additional dollars on a per capita basis. Uh, even though that uh, there's been some pretty significant changes around uh, the formula for uh, devising state aid and the so-called Foundation Budget Review Commission, lots of changes in the uh, foundation budget and how state aid should be calculated. Uh, all of those changes, or many of those changes are implicit in the fiscal 20 uh, state budget, uh, but because of our position in terms of our relative wealth of the community and how much state aid we're already receiving, uh, we're, we're going to continue to get so-called minimum aid um, going forward. So right now it's $20 per student. In terms of uh, what that means of our overall uh, uh, fiscal 20 budget proposal, um, this kind of breaks it out into three different components. Uh, the blue uh, shaded area is uh, so-called local contribution. So this is our $67 million budget broken into kind of three pieces. Local contribution, $47 million or 70%. The uh, current amount of state aid uh, that we're getting in fiscal 19 uh, is, is base aid. That's the floor. It's, it's always the, kind of this hold harmless situation where you never get less state aid in the succeeding year than you have in the current year. Uh, that's been a, a covenant that's been uh, in place since education reform began. And so our base aid is just over $19.8 million. Um, and then the new aid is 120,860. So we've got this 70-30 split between uh, local contribution and state aid uh, that we're looking at for fiscal 20. And you can see how much the, the new minimum aid plays a very small uh, role in uh, funding our upcoming year budget. It's 0.2%. So that's one fifth of 1% for the upcoming year. Shifting gears again into a little bit more of uh, some benchmarking. You know, how do we do in terms of spending in comparison to uh, some of our peer school districts uh, where the state as a whole, uh, you've seen these stats before. This is our uh, per pupil expenditure uh, over time. Again, these statistics are uh, developed and published by the Department of Education and uh, they're on their website, publicly available for everybody to look at. And um, also, again, factor all of those costs that uh, school districts incur, um, not only through their local appropriation, but also support that they get from other municipal, town, or city uh, departments. So uh, you can see in fiscal 15, uh, that rise there, the year of the override, our average cost per pupil went from 11870 up to just over $13,000, but since that time, it's just plateaued and remained uh, flat. Uh, so right now, we're at uh, 13335 and that's for uh, fiscal 17. That's the latest uh, data that they have available. Uh, that <clears throat> $13,000 per student uh, puts us in the uh, bottom 10% of uh, cost per pupil of all the districts uh, in uh, the Commonwealth. How is that compared to some other uh, peer groupings? This first one here is um, a group that the Department of Ed uh, puts together based upon the district size, uh, 
the grade spans that they offer, and then also their special uh, student populations, like percentage of special needs students, low income students, and they kind of factor in like districts based upon those three criteria. And then uh, from this grouping, you can see that we're third from the bottom. Uh, Melrose is the lowest at just over 12,000. In Burlington, another uh, like community uh, based upon this uh, criteria is over $20,000 uh, per pupil <coughs> for fiscal 17. Another way to look at it, um, you heard the presentation from the gentleman from ClearGov. Uh, they do uh, uh, aggregate uh, lots of state data and put it together in uh, some pretty nifty looking uh, charts and graphs. And uh, they also look at uh, communities from purely socioeconomic standpoint. Um, and our peer group, based upon uh, their analysis, is this grouping here, North Attleboro, Belmont, Franklin, Arlington, Chelmsford, and Natick. And we are second from the bottom in terms of uh, that grouping uh, from ClearGov. <clears throat> it's also important to note that when we did the, the per pupil expenditure report, uh, this is talking about costs, but uh, we also made mention of the fact that um, Shrewsbury now um, is in the top 20th percentile for income per capita. Uh, so we are a, a comparatively wealthy community, and um, so it's very much a fair comparison to compare us to Belmont and Arlington and, and communities like that in Natick. Um, this one here, uh, basically, it's, it kind of looks busy, but uh, what we're trying to show here is two different data points, in, and that is, so at the end of the day, what's my average tax bill? And what is, what is the tax rate? And uh, so the tax rate is the red line there. <clears throat> and you can, this is from fiscal 18. And you can see Shrewsbury in the yellow bar here. Uh, we have, and these are surrounding communities uh, geographically in, in Worcester County and, 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 and the like. And you can see that we're at the lowest uh, tax rate, $12.66 per thousand of valuation. And we are third from the bottom in terms of average tax bill, which for this year was $5,560, and you get a high just over $10,000 <clears> and a low of Millbury, which is about $4,400. And then uh, finally, um, we, we have in the past often got this question about, you know, what do you do to, uh, besides go to town meeting and ask for you know, the appropriation, what else do you do as a school department to try to generate other revenue sources? And some of these things I mentioned earlier at the very beginning, which is, you know, how we fund the operation. And so, uh, obviously, we get uh, significant revenues for uh, fees. Uh, we've maximized uh, a lot of different uh, opportunities to generate revenue. Uh, we have sought uh, numerous private grants and sponsorships and hope to have some good news on that front uh, going forward. We've got some uh, pieces in the pipeline about some other grants. Uh, and then a couple years ago, the school committee voted to open up school choice on a, a very limited targeted basis uh, to create a recurring revenue stream. And so we have 25 students now still persisting from that original 30 that the school committee authorized. And so that generates uh, $5,000 per student or $125,000 in revenue. So we plan for that revenue coming in, and we use that to offset teacher salaries. So all these costs that you see, the $67 million that we bring to town meeting, that's net mm -hmm. after we already have factored in this uh, school choice and other types of revenues. All right. So when leading up to the opportunity to ask us about the status quo budget, and then we'll talk about these strategic investments. Um, you know, we included this slide, this was the uh, campaign that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education put together over the past year uh, because they had data that showed that a lot of Massachusetts residents didn't realize that we have uh, essentially the strongest public schools in the nation on a whole variety of measures. Um, and truly, <coughs> of course, performing uh, in the upper echelon of, around among Massachusetts districts, uh, we can say uh, in a very reasonable way uh, that we're among one of the highest performing school districts in the nation. Um, it's something we're particularly proud of. Um, at the same time, uh, we have work to do 
uh, as I had talked about in my State of the District report. Um, and uh, I think it was summarized well, actually, by uh, Commissioner Jeffrey Riley, the new commissioner of the department, uh, when he was referring to the leading the nation piece. And uh, you know, we're leading the nation under a paradigm um, that people are, are calling into question more and more in terms of what, whether it's really serving the needs of our children uh, and, and young people as well as it needs to, given what their future holds. Um, and the analogy he drew, which I thought was apropos, uh, was that it may be that our lead in the nation statistics are much like being blockbuster video in 1988. Uh, on top of the world and first leading the field, uh, but if someone had a bit of a crystal ball about to get wiped off the face of the earth because things were going to change pretty dramatically. Um, and, his, and his question to us was, uh, this was the assembled superintendents at our uh, winter meeting, um, how do we become Netflix? Um, and I think that's what you'll hear a lot about when we talk uh, in a few moments after you've had an opportunity to ask questions about this portion around our strategic investments. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll break. And if there are questions or comments you'd like to make about the status quo budget and the materials that Mr. Collins and I presented, um, and then once uh, we've done that, uh, we'll be able to uh, move forward and talk about the rest of, the, of this calendar and then uh, what these strategic investments will, will be making. Colleagues, questions or comments at this time? I think we might just be ready to move on. Okay. Keep going. So we are here. I know you can't read this because it's small, but it's just an idea. If you look where the arrow is, we're about uh, a third of the way through the budget process. We're presenting this this evening. Uh, we'll then be going through some very specific presentations about areas of the budget over our uh, next several school committee meetings, meeting with the Finance Committee, and, and doing the work uh, as we head towards town meeting and approval of the budget in May. Um, but what this is really about is, you know, how do we... Uh, focus on meeting uh, the expectations of our community. Uh, we know that uh, there's an expectation we prepare students for college and career in an environment that's rapidly changing. Um, how do we respond to different societal dilemmas? We know that we have uh, an increase in mental health issues among young people. We know that we have a landscape that's changing because of the legalization of marijuana. We know we have an opioid e epidemic and there's expectations that our schools are going to be educating our kids around these issues. Um, not to mention vaping has now become, uh, come to the forefront of a public health <coughs> issue. Um, how do we provide challenging academics to a very wide range of students, which of course is part and parcel of being a public uh, education organization? And how do we provide a wide array of co-curricular programs, uh, much like the new one you saw earlier this evening in terms of the esports, um, to make sure kids have an opportunity to excel in something that they're interested in and passionate about? Um, so we did uh, uh, bring to the committee and through a very... Uh, detailed process. Uh, you adopted the portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate. Um, there are six major areas that are illustrated in the, uh, the uh, visual there that uh, talk about what we're trying to provide to kids. Um, and, the, and notice that none of them say get higher test scores. Uh, that may be one measure of some elements of that, maybe critical thinking or content mastery, but we know innovation, resilience and focus. How do you become a good citizen and you're engaged with your community? How do you collaborate and communicate? Uh, how is it that you can be a leader uh, by influencing others, not necessarily in a, in a formal position, uh, but how do you influence the improvement of others or, or a team, uh, which is such a critical skill? Um, so that vision was laid out. Um, then we created uh, a set of strategic priorities to say, well, over the next five years, what are the most important areas for us to, to focus on and, and focus our efforts and our energy and our resources on? Uh, in order to uh, move those forward, and we'll talk about those. Uh, but I know that in the budget presentation or in the, the, uh, my budget message, uh, there was a quote from Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher, uh, that I have to uh, admit Mr. Collins uh, put that quote there. I can't take credit for it. Uh, you know, the only thing that is constant is change. Uh, if you read the article in the Telegram Gazette just the other day, uh, the new, relatively new CEO of Hanover Insurance, Jack Roach, um, told uh, collected business people in Worcester that you can't, uh, to prosper, uh, you can't have a static strategy. Um, and then Mr. Collins also put this, I don't tend to quote myself in my <laughs> presentations, uh, but, you know, we, we, are, we, you know, we want to be clear with the community that we require additional resources beyond a status quo budget to achieve our strategic uh, priorities and, and goals. See, I knew you were going to say that. Absolutely. So uh, now, it's, now, now it's a quote. Um, so, you know, how, wh wh what is this focus? So we have this five-year plan that I referred to uh, a moment ago. If you could advance one more. Uh, you know, this is what is going to best support our students. It meets the community's expectations because the portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate 
and the strategic priorities were based on lots and lots of feedback from parents, from community members, from our students, from our staff. Uh, it was a very thorough process that illustrated this is what people want from their schools. So our job is to figure out how to best deliver that. And what I'm saying to the committee and to the community is that um, although there are lots of things we can do with our current level of resources, um, I, I have a hard time seeing how we can deliver on what we're being expected to do over the next five-year period um, without additional resources that are targeted towards those things. Um, and so we have, um, you know, for next year and in future years, um, we're looking at what is it that these strategic investments need to be to achieve that, that vision, strategy, and goals. Um, we have a set of uh, strategic investments. This is just a summary uh, uh, table that shows um, how those will be broken down across personnel and contracted services, um, instructional materials, and technology. Um, <coughs> overall, it would be about 1.97 million of additional dollars that would be uh, need to come through the appropriated budget. We also are identifying close to $400,000 that we think we could do through other sources of funding. Uh, we want to continue to try to maximize that to the greatest extent we possibly can. Um, and again, this is an example, this is an illustration of the pent-up demand uh, that, we, that we see that we have. Um, so uh, what I'll ask is uh, my colleagues to take us through uh, these different strategic priority areas, starting with one that obviously is very important given we're still a growing community, and that's space and resources to support effective learning. Okay, thank you. So this first goal that we had as part of uh, our strategic priority plan and our two-year district goals was to uh, provide a new communication tool uh, that would uh, more easily um, explain uh, school finances and our budget to the larger community. And you heard a uh, presentation uh, from uh, the president of ClearGov just a, a few weeks ago, uh, which is that web-based product um, that we're in the uh, Pipeline. We have state grant funding actually through the town manager's office and the community compact grant uh, to fund that for the upcoming year. That's why this $12,500 is in that other funding uh, uh, sources category. So we don't need any local appropriation for that for fiscal 20. Uh, and this would be a pilot year. It would be a year of training for our staff in terms of uh, how to upload information, how to adjust it, how to use uh, potentially in future years uh, a budgeting tool that they've just recently developed. And so going forward, if uh, we feel like this is an effective tool, then we would have to shift and take on that cost as a community, and those dollars would have to shift over in a future year budget to the local operating budget. Uh, but <clears throat> this is how we plan to, for the upcoming year, uh, fund that particular goal. The second one is to complete uh, a pre-K through uh, preschool through grade 12 space and enrollment uh, study and uh, we would have to contract with an outside consultant and architect uh, to assist us with that to help us uh, assess our future needs of course we're very excited about the Beale school project and the space that will provide on a K through 4 uh, basis and meet our needs going forward uh, but we need to take a step back now and look at the other ends of the district both preschool and high school we, where we do have pressure as was uh, mentioned earlier uh, and so that cost is estimated to be $150,000 and there is funding within the Beale School project uh, that was part of the feasibility uh, study of, uh, appropriation that was made and so we're looking forward to getting that project done with a portion of the Beale School uh, appropriation that's why again it's in that particular category uh, the last one in this slide is in terms of uh, resources uh, to support effective learning is adding uh, another high school science teacher uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, this is also just part of, uh, we, we happen to have a faculty member who uh, is retiring and, and teaches in both disciplines, both science and math, which is really unique uh, and difficult, very difficult to find. And uh, so the plan would be to replace that person and hire uh, a new math teacher and then also hire uh, a science teacher in addition to that and uh, help us with class sizes and uh, also offering uh, the right amount of sections of each of the science courses that we need uh, for that growing enrollment. <coughs> These next two uh, 
The first goal here is, is a goal of eliminating shared staff uh, between the high school, Sherwood, uh, and uh, Oak Middle Schools. Uh, right now we have a number of staff who travel, uh, who teach music, foreign language, or art, uh, and they are traveling between those three schools. Um, you know, on the one hand, <clears throat> it might sound efficient that you have a, a teacher doing that, but th there is also inefficiencies in that, uh, that you lose travel time, and uh, the high school schedule does not align with the middle school schedule. And so when you're sharing uh, staff, um, you know, it's difficult to uh, leverage the total time of that individual when you got two different uh, school schedules to try to meet. So uh, it would afford uh, all three schools uh, much more flexibility and uh, potentially course <clears throat> offerings like you heard uh, from uh, the directors, the music and art director earlier uh, this year if we were able to hire uh, 3.5 additional teachers as what we think it would take to eliminate that shared staffing and um, provide those resources to each of those three schools. And then finally would be the addition of another uh, school counselor or AKA guidance counselor. Uh, again, this is to address uh, growing enrollment uh, at the high school and provide uh, uh, better caseloads for the school counselors and also so that they might uh, shift some of their work into assisting students uh, plan through and, and assess their own uh, interests going forward beyond uh, uh, college and maybe some career exploration and uh, uh, do a little bit more work in that area. So that would be another $65,000 uh, budgeted for another school counselor. The second strategic priority is uh, about learning environments where everyone's success matters, which is really about finding ways for all of our kids to, find, to be able to uh, get the kind of learning supports that they need to be successful. Um, and as Ms. Belsito to speak to the uh, suggested strategic investments in this, in this category. Okay. So first off, um, we're looking at over the next few years to have 50% of our faculty um, to have training regarding cultural proficiency <coughs> and teaching practices. So we've had two small groups attend um, cultural proficiency seminar series offered through our collaborative, Assabet Valley. Uh, we plan to grow our practice by contracting with an agency like ABC <coughs> to provide these trainings. As an example, our um, regional youth health survey that was conducted with our students was disaggregated by race, um, economically disadvantaged students, uh, immigrant refugee status, and looking at that um, in a limited scope right now, we clearly see that further work is needed in the area of equity. Um, we would like to conduct an equity study um, over the next um, couple years, and we will contract with consultants to promote and conduct um, this racial equity assessment. We seek to increase our staff knowledge in the area of cultural proficiency at an individual and an organizational level. Um, the district needs this assessment. We need a customized implementation plan and professional development opportunities um, that would ensure all of our staff policies and practices provide an opportunity for effective interactions among our students, our educators, and community members. Um, the next thing is we'd like to procure and develop a tracking um, tool with key metrics around high needs. And when we talk about high needs, we're talking about a subgroup of students that are likely to miss educational milestones and the data is broken down by race, ethnicity, and other demographic groupings. Um, right now in the district, um, when we took a look at this earlier in the year, out of 6,214 students, we had 1,014 117 students that uh, met this criteria. So um, the last piece on this slide is to procure research proven intervention for our high needs. And this is um, learning and development so it's possible for every student. We must adapt um, to the diversity of our community and allow students to see their lives reflected in curriculum, instructional materials, and school practices. So on this next slide, um, we're talking about specific personnel needs. And so to improve the educational services to special education students at the elementary level based on projections from the past <coughs> three years. And at the next meeting, um, I can go into some more detail, but right now based on these projections, um, we see the need for one severely licensed special education teacher and one moderate special education teacher. 
Um, also, by June of 2020, at least 50% of all of our staff um, will have participated in professional development regarding inclusive practices. So what we are aiming to do um, is enhance our shared understanding and ability to engage in inclusive and culturally proficient practices, the skills, habits, and mindsets of social and emotional learning and mental and behavioral health of all. Um, because as we know, educational excellence cannot exist without educational equality. And now I'll turn it over to Amy to start our discussion on the enhanced well-being for all, and I'll jump in at, I think, the next slide. Thanks. So I know you've heard a lot about social-emotional learning, and this slide essentially summarizes some of the investments we'd like to make uh, that mirror what we would do in terms of improving our academic program. Um, so uh, we have several stakeholder groups in the district currently looking at current practices in social-emotional learning. We were fortunate to get a grant from the state to participate in a network of districts. Um, through the Excel uh, program. So we've been working with the Rennie Center and uh, with representatives from the state to kind of take a look at what we mean by social emotional learning um, and high quality PD that relates to, to that domain. Um, we've got a group from the high school going to William James, or the new Teachers 21 organization, thinking about an implementation plan with a particular focus on secondary level. Um, and we have some in-district groups, both at the school level and at the district level, um, inventorying current practices and making recommendations about um, who are the key players in, in teaching and modeling social emotional practice and where do kids get to apply those skills and what are some resources that we need to provide in order to support staff um, in implementing them. So we anticipate that we'll have some recommendations at the end of this year to come back and give you more details about, but uh, that first line item kind of speaks to what will the materials we need um, in, in order to further SEL curriculum. And the second piece speaks to kind of how we provide training for staff. So we have a number of um, opportunities, kind of, for example, responsive classroom at the elementary level or uh, the advisory program and model that's being piloted at the middle school level. Um, but within those two structures, we also need to kind of think about where some particular skills that we need to help kids understand um, in order and in practice. So for example, we know that self-regulation is a key part of minimizing anxiety and being able to identify emotions and then think about how to manage them is important. If you have a designated meeting time, you still need some materials to guide a teacher in how we help kids get consistent messages about how they know kind of where they are in the thermometer and what they should do about it. Um, so the second piece speaks to kind of staff training um, the other piece, uh, line three, speaks to kind of a pilot that we have going this year at Floral Street School and the high school where we're looking at um, how we could use survey tools to help kids identify themselves, you know, where do they see their strengths in various SEL competencies, um, and then how we can use that to generate caseloads of kids to monitor, um, or how we can use feedback from the aggregate to think about where we need to make the most of our investments. So do we need to look, for example, at um, decision making or do we need to look more at self-regulation? Um, collecting some data from students at those two levels is helping us think about the whole idea of SEL assessment. Um, and finally, uh, the school start time committee will be convening to kind of look at some recommendations around um, changing transportation planning and, and looking at whether uh, the cost and benefit of, of making a switch to our start, start times um, to allow, as you know, kids at the high school level to have a little bit more sleep and our early risers at elementary to kind of maximize their learning too. Uh, so that's that line item there speaks to that. Um, so the next few uh, items talk about counseling and mental and behavioral health supports and our thoughts, our initial thoughts right now over um, this school year and obviously moving forward into the next couple of years. So what we're looking to do right now is to focus on how um, counselors and behavioral and mental health supports play a vital role in identifying, supporting, and intervening when students exhibit mental and behavioral health challenges in the school environment, um, whether it's counseling, crisis intervention, family engagement, engagement or care coordination. Um, so what we're looking to do right now is add um, adjustment counseling at the middle school level at Sherwood specifically. Um, we're looking at the need truly at the elementary level to put more across our elementary schools and right now we're looking at possibly um, the need for three additional staff um, across five buildings 
and then also um, an adjustment counselor at our high school. Um, these roles are going to be pivotal in the next uh, few years. The initial um, information that's been obtained, especially from the Risk Youth Health Survey, indicates, um, as you know and you've heard us talk about, that our students are reporting stress as their top issue and that suicidal ideation and attempts are con also occurring at concerning levels. Our faculty advisory council, as well as our paraprofessional advisory council, have reported to administration this year that social, emotional, mental, and behavioral health needs of our students are a top priority for them as they continue to see students who require support around self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. So our counseling and mental and behavioral support will be key um, to the overall well-being of our student success in the coming years. The next slide speaks to um, some of the input that we received from other district leaders. So one of the privileges I had in my first year in the role <coughs> last year was to work with the physical education department. And as you know, as we approach the budget season, sometimes we recommend kind of the best of the worst ideas when we have to close a budget gap and we lost our grade four teacher, uh, health teacher. Um, we are fortunate in Shrewsbury that we have middle school teachers and Sherwood could be considered in the elementary span. So we felt that that was, um, you know, that cut was offset by some other personnel. But one of the things that we've really benefited from is having some fresh eyes on, on our uh, system this year in the person of the new PE health and family consumer science director, Jeff Lane. And um, when he looked at our programming, and certainly as he became involved in some of our social emotional learning initiatives, um, his perspective really is that uh, the health curriculum plays a, a really important role in addressing some of the mental health issues that we've seen identified in some of our survey data. So um, we'd like to see uh, re restore that position at, at grade four. Um, in addition to that, um, we are working to revise some of that health curriculum to make it more relevant and updated. It's been a while since that's happened and um, the health department has been looking to see what are the progressions of topics across levels. Um, so in addition to looking at kind of the SEL materials that would live um, within the classroom teacher piece, we're looking also at revising materials within health in general. The next uh, category, our last and fourth strategic priority is around <coughs> connected learning for a complex world, uh, which is uh, a lot about trying to find ways to get students learning outside of the walls of the high school um, and uh, more connected to uh, the world beyond it and thinking about their, their future plans. Um, the first line item here uh, uh, was on the uh, initial budget request last year uh, for an additional assistant superintendent position that would be focused on building community partnerships as well as supporting uh, well-being in a variety of ways. Uh, that is not in the request for the appropriated budget. However, um, we are seeking some outside funding for that, and I, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll have some news to share in the near future um, relative to that. Um, but combined with that also would be uh, through a potential partnership, uh, a van, because uh, one of the things we've heard from our faculty and, and administration is getting kids out requires transportation and uh, you know, with, with, with traditional school bus transportation that's often difficult to do during the school day. So that could provide a, a, a level of flexibility to get our students out into different kinds of uh, <coughs> quote-unquote real-world experiences. Um, in addition, though, this obviously is in, in Ms. Clowder's uh, area of expertise relative to curriculum and instruction. Um, and so she'll talk about some of these other, many of which are mandated changes that are mainly coming from the state relative to curriculum changes. So the good news about curriculum budget is that there's usually not a curriculum crisis, right? We have some predictability in terms of what our costs are. Um, and at the same time, if we have a system that embraces continuous improvement, then we need to continually invest in the learners that we have before us. Uh, so we need to update our curriculum and we also need to be both responsive to kind of the innovators in our system. And for us, our innovators are our teachers. So uh, what I'm going to speak to in the next couple of slides has to do with kind of teacher investments, um, investments in tools that allow teachers to collaborate or team investments, um, and also kind of some traditional resources that we can anticipate built into any curriculum budget over time. So when you look here at um, the appropriated budget for uh, state changes in civics education, uh, that reflects the new social science standards um, and the history changes that uh, have come from DESE. Um, they would like us to implement fully a new curriculum <laughs> next year um, with a priority specifically on grades three, five, and eight to introduce civics education. Um, we've 
slow down a little bit to think about how we can keep the best of what we've been doing and how we can adjust things across levels. Um, and to be honest, that's kind of a new thing for us to collaborate across levels. Um, and since some major units are shifting, for example, um, you know, grade eight had had some world civilization that would now move to the high school. Um, we're going to have to foster some collaboration that we haven't in the past. Um, so that uh, $25,000 there speaks to some of those changes that we anticipate making as part of history and social science. Um, we, one of the things we can anticipate is that we're going to have to um, add tr teacher training when we add more AP classes. Um, and so we need to put some more money into that given some of the turnover that we've had with t people who have been teaching AP, um, AP sorry, <laughs> in <laughs> English science um, and also math this year. So that number is a little bit higher than it typically is because we have um, new teacher training demands in, in three content areas at the high school. Um, when Brian was sitting with me last year to talk about our curriculum instruction technology budget, we talked about the aging projection systems that we can see some of the first systems that came online now fading. Um, so the next item reflects kind of investing in the computer lab at the high school um, with that increasing operating speed and capacity in mind. Uh, uh, Todd was talking about uh, the gaming piece and how the um, arrow hives kind of help facilitate some of the gameplay and practice, but we need to look at some of the hardware systems too. Um, and finally, the projection, projection devices that facilitate some of the online learning through the iPads need to be replaced. And so that's um, the last item that $200,000 is addressing. And the next slide, um, you can, you heard um, from the science presentation kind of uh, what's entailed uh, in terms of making some of the switches to the new practices and science standards. <coughs> and when we think about um, how we're going to make that shift in social science, we're starting again with the practices. Um, and one of the things that's helpful about that is that that was the way we approached math, the way we approached science. And yet, for social science, particularly at the elementary level, it integrates English language arts and social science. And because we have uh, very busy uh, elementary educators that are generalists, in other words, they teach all the content areas and their focus is on really developing strong readers and mathematicians, um, we need to think about integration because if we add up what we've advised teachers to focus on, you know, 90 minutes of math, 90 minutes of ELA, this much more science. There's not a left room <laughs> left for social science unless we look at integration. So we really need some outside expertise to help us consult and think about how can we take a new look at some of our English language arts curriculum with both the civics piece in mind and also social science. Um, and that work will help us also move closer to a model that um, embraces project-based learning, particularly when it has to do with community involvement or community service. The science curriculum piece, um, those are just the materials uh, that it's going to take, both the online subscription for mystery science and STEM scopes at the middle school, as well as some of the physical materials that um, facilitate some of the design thinking that you saw in action at the presentation that uh, our teachers made. Um, and as I mentioned, kind of the value of integrating and, and developing some project-based learning. Um, we've appropriated some money for in-district training, so sending people to conferences, um, looking at what are some existing models and units that we might add to our curriculum to get closer to a portrait of a graduate model across levels that give kids more consistency. Right now we know we have lots of bright spots where kids are um, experiencing high leverage projects and, and a high degree of agency, but we don't have that consistently. So that gives us um, some time to develop some PD around that. And finally, um, we've looked at what are the materials that are going to be needed in order to support some of those shifts in thinking. Um, so those two, those last two line items are related. One of the things that came out from uh, the district leadership team is, um, you know, over time we've really sacrificed kind of an, uh, limited the sending people out to conferences. Um, and while we have a high value of collaboration and we have real innovators in-house, we've not had a lot of opportunities to tap into networks beyond um, kind of ed, ed 21. So we're thinking about how we could build in a modest budget for um, professional networks kind of beyond our system because some of the things that um, 
are coming out of those networks are really helpful to advancing some of our strategic priorities. So this last category is not a strategic priority per se, but we know that we also, and you know year to year, we have things that we're mandated to do. Um, and so I'll ask Ms. Belsito to speak to some things in the special education, people, personnel services realm uh, that we believe, regardless of what happens, we're going to need to fund. I'm um, then asking uh, Ms. Malone to speak to a, a, something that we'll be bringing to you in more detail uh, based on a study relative to our organizational capacity um, to meet the expectations that are, that are demanded of us. Um, but I'll ask Ms. Belsito to speak to those positions. So the first position that you'll see is an educational learning center coordinator. And right now we feel as though this position will be needed at Parker Road Preschool. Um, in working with Lisa Robinson, the principal, as well as Kristen Herrick, the director of specialized programming, and um, Megan Bartlett, the assistant director for special education, looking at the level of need of the preschoolers right now in the program and the projections coming in from early intervention. Um, just as an example, right now we're at 25 in that particular classroom. So we know that we will um, need a position um, next year. Um, as far as the next one, um, we are looking at caseloads across the district um, and with Mr. Bazidlo and Kathy LaRoche, the um, high school special education director who's um, semi-retired right now, um, we have determined that the caseload right now at the high school is anywhere from 15 to 28. And also with our incoming eighth graders into the high school next year, we're projecting um, a need for a moderate special education teacher at the high school. Um, again, in talking with Noel Freeman, the director of nursing, as well as uh, Mr. Bazidlo, um, we are also are looking <coughs> at a nursing need, and right now we're um, looking at the need for 0.7 um, due to increasing medical complexities also. Um, 2.7, so we have two and 2.7 nurses for approximately 1,800 students. It would mirror the support currently at our middle schools, which is 1.4 nurses for approximately 1,000 students. So um, you've heard me speak before and Mr. Collins speak as well um, that we have some drivers to our uh, operations that are coming from outside of us. One of those is data that's coming from the um, Department of Education. Some of that data is uh, surrounding who are our high need students and the analysis of that. But they're also requiring more data from us. Um, more reporting and, and it's more more detailed and usual, utilizing certain platforms. And we also have the size of the district impacting both the central office and special education office operations. So we um, contracted with a consulting group from UMass to um, meet with our staff. They're comparing benchmarks to um, other communities and have interviewed staff um, both at the central office and the special education office uh, around questions about time capacity, technical skills and training, opportunities to improve efficiency, ways to better serve uh, the staff, ways to better serve our parents um, and a community that looks to central office and special ed education office for support and also to look at any outdated practices that we may still have in place. Um, so you'll be hearing more about that in probably the March timeframe, um, but we are anticipating that there will be a need for either a reorganization or additional um, staff. And so we have that uh, item in the operating budget um, just because so many of these things are mandated. They're mandated services to the special education department or it's mandated that we're looking at certain data from the state or it's mandated that we report certain information to the state. And I also want to take this opportunity to just speak overall. Um, you heard many of the individual um, requests were, in, were involving staff requests, FTE. And um, if it, I think it was one of the slides uh, earlier, the summary of strategic investments by category. Um, personnel was close to 1.5 million um, in our, our requests of, um, of our strategic investments. We're in the people business. 83% of our FY20 investment is about staff. Um, that salaries, we, we are teaching students, we're supporting families, 
we're supporting guardians. Um, this is all to do with people and we have to have the proper personnel in place to support that. All of the things we've talked about, um, all of the strategic priorities um, really can't happen without staff resources devoted to them. So I did just want to take a moment to mention that as well. <coughs> Okay, and just to uh, provide another recap of uh, the strategic um, priority investments, uh, you saw a chart earlier by category, personnel, um, equipment, um, and the like. This takes the same information that you just heard about all the details about and summarizes it by strategic priority. And um, so you can see at the top the four strategic priorities uh, listed in the funding uh, you know, it's, it's distributed, you know, fairly <laughs> even uh, across uh, the, the four strategic priorities. And then the fifth co category, Dr. Uh, Sawyer mentioned that uh, the other necessary priorities are just mandated to do. So, again, $2.36 million of um, uh, resources that we're looking for uh, in order to uh, meet the objectives that were set forth for us uh, in partnership with the community uh, to bring the district forward. Uh, of that uh, 2.36 million, 83% um, you know, of it uh, would be from the operating budget or town appropriation, and 17% of it would be from other sources. Again, seeking grant funding, um, primarily or you know, state or, or private grant funding uh, along the way. So we'll continue to do that. You know, this is not just an all ask at town meeting. We do continue to look for <coughs> other revenue sources along the way. Um, <clears throat> so if we want to make progress, uh, we need some additional resources. Uh, these last two pieces of information are, are just some charts that show, again, kind of a time span. Uh, and what this, this first chart does is the blue bars are what uh, the superintendent's uh, initial budget recommendations were back in each of these fiscal years going back to fiscal 09. And then the red bar would be uh, actually the, the final resulting uh, appropriation on a percentage basis. And you can see that, you know, there's always a gap between, you know, what's requested and what's provided, and that gap varies depending on the year, uh, how big or small it is. <clears throat> um, and then on the far right, uh, you can see in the green bar is <clears throat> the fiscal 20 uh, status uh, quo budget, if you will, at 4.69%. So this is a little bit different. It's not like kind of an even comparison here because we've kind of broken it into two parts. So I'm going to show you the next slide in a minute. But 4.69% is the status quo budget. Right now, um, you know, the town manager, uh, Mr. Mizikar, has released his initial budget uh, and made that public. And uh, it calls for a 3.29% increase uh, for the school department budget. And of course, that will change uh, along the way, uh, hopefully you know, increasing a bit depending on um, how revenues and expenses shape up uh, from his perspective and new information on state aid potentially. Um, this chart here shows it just adds in <clears throat> all the strategic investments uh, uh, for the town appropriation that brings a percentage from 4.69 to 4.7 up to 7.7. So it's an additional 3% uh, for all of those things that we just uh, detailed for you. Uh, and so that does create, of course, a larger uh, uh, gap. Um, and I think that's all we have for uh, presentation and information. So we thank you for your attention. We know that's a lot of information at once. This is by far the most detailed presentation we make uh, of the year. Uh, I appreciate you bearing with us as we try to illustrate both what it takes to take you know, an existing program that's complex and bring it forward, as well as make these various investments in areas that uh, the community has said, these are where we want to focus our time and energy and ultimately our resources. Um, and with that, we're obviously happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Colleagues, questions and comments? <coughs> Mrs. Fritz. 
Um, thank you. I really like the way this is laid out. Um, you can tie in a status quo. We all know what that type of budget is. But then looking at what we need to move the district forward. I mean, a lot of work was put into Ports River Graduate, looking at strategic priorities and goals. It's what the community wants. It's what students, parents, teachers want. So we're looking at um, a budget based on how do we get from A to B with uh, guidelines. We know what we need to do, but we need funding to get there. So I think this lays it out very well for anyone who's looking at it and maybe isn't familiar with school budgeting. So I think it's very, very well done. Um, two questions on the van that's going to be potentially, do we need a driver for that van? Is that a potential additional FTE or is there someone in house? Have we even thought that far yet? Yeah. I know that you, you had some, some experience with that previous district, so maybe you can speak to that, Mr. Collins. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So the you know, the vehicle that we're anticipating purchasing would just require a regular driver's license so that uh, any faculty member um, or counselor uh, could drive. It wouldn't okay. require, uh, you know, a dedicated driver. There might be, depending on, um, you know, the time of day or the programs that we're running, uh, that we may have to um, look for uh, driver services so we're not taking a staff member out of uh, the facility. So it could go either way, but the vehicle that we're going to purchase is not going to require any specialized licensing. It would be anything that uh, a vehicle that anybody uh, could could drive. And mm -hmm. you know, that's the model, as Dr. Sawyer has mentioned, that you know a lot of vocational schools mm -hmm. use that their teachers are driving their students to off-site work projects or mm -hmm. uh, even you know those types of vehicles are used for college visits right. um, uh, or businesses. So that's what we're anticipating. Okay, thanks. And if that goes forward in terms of being the, uh, we'll, we'll provide a much more detailed mm -hmm. uh, piece, obviously, to the committee at that point, but we're working on some outside funding for that. Great, thanks. And my second question is around the social emotional. I mean, we're really, we need to look at children, teachers, everyone holistically. So we're doing really good work. Um, and we have groups working on it. I think it would be great. I don't know if it's just me, but if we could have a presentation um, while we go through the budget to talk about what's being done, where we're at, just to give us a better understanding and the public how much work is going into this and why these types of additional supports are needed. I think it would just add some clarity. I don't know how anybody else feels, but I think that would be helpful. Dr. McGee. Yeah, I, I agree with Sandy on this. I, I think that um, there are a number of things that contribute to increases in the cost of providing an education, and one is just the scope of services provided. And while I think most of us are used to the idea that there's going to be an element of behavioral um, uh, sciences applied to students with IEPs, the fact is that the uh, behavioral services that are uh, essentially moving into the, the uh, rest of the education system seem to be increasing. It would be very nice for us to quantify that and to, to get a sense as to how much of the budget and, and how much uh, this is increasing per year so that we can better um, uh, explain this to the community because this is a this is an inflator. Uh, it's a, it's an expansion of the scope. Um, can I make another comment? Go ahead. While I'm at it, I, this I have to say this is one of the best budget presentations I've I've heard in my nine years uh, on the school committee, and and I'm particularly pleased with the idea that you're providing perspective regarding the fact that the town appropriated budget is not the whole enchilada. That there are a lot of expenses that come from the town or from other sources. Uh, that contribute to the to the uh, cost of the schools, and uh, particularly that all of these other sources are essentially flat. So that when we look at um, what percent the town appropriated budget is going up by, part of that is the fact that uh, most of the normal inflation is being shift shifted to the uh, funds that are coming from the town itself. And that, that is intentional. It is not an oversight. It is not the inability to apply for grants. It is a conscious decision on the part of the state to uh, uh, make the town of Shrewsbury pay a higher percentage of the amount of money that is spent on its local school systems. And so I think you illustrated that well. Thank you. Mr. Wenske. Yeah, just to add to that, I <clears throat> appreciate the level of detail in this report. Um, I, it's it's very easy read, although a lot to consume. Um, it, the understanding, you know, even for somebody that is new to school budgeting, to understand that it's more than just the appropriated budget that funds the school system, I think that's really important to note. Um, <clears throat> I also like that we've 
aligned our budget investment needs with our strategic mm -hmm. priority, something that was a, a community-wide collaboration with you know parents, caretakers, students, faculty, staff, educators. A lot of time went into that, and I think to see on paper you know, where our greatest needs are to achieve those priorities, I think are really important. And, and this becomes essentially, from my perspective, a living document. You know, where, where are our greatest needs to achieve those priorities? And essentially what you've done is provided us with a kind of a gap analysis, you know, to, to, to focus in on where, our, you know, our needs are, are most uh, to make the product of education uh, the best it could be. So thank you so much. I just had a quick comment there. One thing I meant to say in one of those last, uh, where it showed the difference between the status quo budget and you know, the strategic priorities piece. Uh, <coughs> it is not my uh, an, an analysis that the town will be able to afford to do all of this in one year. Uh, that would be terrific if they could and if there were some uh, windfall that came into play. Um, but that, that's not really realistic to expect. Um, our hope would be that uh, between uh, what we're able to do with the various sources of revenue as we look closely at how this year is running, um, you know, right now it, I don't anticipate we'll be in a situation where we need to be considering cuts, uh, which obviously when we're not spending time and energy doing that, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, to some degree that we'd be able to uh, finance some of these strategic investments um, in fiscal year 2020. Um, uh, the, the greater we can, the better off we will be. Uh, but I think it's also important for the community to understand that th this is not, uh, this is something that we're going to need to be doing over time. And so having this conversation and making sure that there's clarity around what we believe the investments that are needed and then having a conversation about how we can find the resources to make those investments is going to be very important. Mrs. Gonzano. I was actually going to ask a question around that. So, and I think the the, the second thing that comes to mind then is about like the ranking of strategic, the strategic investments. I, I see they're not ranked in any order. There's are not by numeral. Right. So, and I'm going to expect that that was deliberate. That is correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something actually that you know having presented these uh, and knowing that we'll be asking you know you'll be holding a budget hearing at some point. We haven't formalized which date that is, um, in terms of the initial budget hearing. Uh, we'll be soliciting feedback uh, on the budget. And certainly one of the things that uh, we'll be looking for and we'll be doing internally is with the understanding that there will be some things likely we will not be able to fund what would be the priorities, you know, in mm -hmm. year one if we're able to fund them. Um, they're all priorities to a degree, and, and so we're, we're reluctant to say one is we can do that, that finally. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's no question that there are some things, uh, especially as we're looking at enrollment pressures and especially as we're looking at some of these issues relative to student emotional and behavioral health, I would say off the top of my head, those are the two areas we're going to have to look at most closely in terms of doing something right away. And if I, um, a, a comment I had to make is I was struck by the language that Meg and Amy used about this customized implementation plan. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talked about it in, in your, and that's what these strategic investments remind me of, that it's a customized implementation plan, um, customized to meet the, the needs uh, of the district and the students and the staff and the faculty. Um, and the implementation part is kind of on our side, is, is the resource piece, um, both here at the school committee level and at the town level. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the piece that we're going to have to figure out as this process goes along. But I feel like we have a really good customized plan in place uh, for next year and maybe, you know, a few years down the road. But um, it was again, uh, to echo my colleagues, just really, really helpful and detailed and um, makes me really excited about what we can do for students. I'll just add on that I appreciate breaking down tonight's presentation by strategic investment. Obviously, it's a good news story that we're not looking at making cuts, which is a different situation mm -hmm. than, than this district has been in many a budget cycle over, so that is certainly refreshing. Um, when I look at the different pockets of strategic investments into you know, this committee, put a, a great deal of thought in, especially with the support of central office staff, into our five-year strategic priorities. Uh, we know where we want our district to go in the coming years, and we have discussed many times the fact that getting there, achieving those goals, is going to require significant investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as Dr. Sawyer noted, we're not going to be able to make all of these investments at once, uh, but I appreciate being able to see the level of detail and thought that has been put into each to give this committee 
uh, and to give the public uh, that's that window into what the choices are in front of us you know it's it's often said about municipal budgeting that what communities fund is what communities value and unfortunately for us uh, here in Shrewsbury we value a great deal more than we're going to be able to fund so though we have a good news story and that we're not looking at cuts we do certainly have difficult decisions ahead mm -hmm. in terms of how we want to prioritize these investments all of which uh, have their place and all of which are important and all of which are a part of our strategic vision for 2022. So I thank you to you, Dr. Sawyer, and the entire central office team for the level of detail in this presentation. And I'll just close by uh, noting to the community that we are certainly interested in receiving ongoing feedback throughout this process. There will be a public hearing at a future date. Uh, and certainly this is something that will impact the whole community. So we look forward to whatever feedback folks would like to offer. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is under new business. Uh, it is a, an informational update on the Assabet Valley Collaborative. I'll speak slowly so the superintendent has time to get back here. Uh, by way of background, the state law governing educational collaboratives requires four updates each year to member school districts. Uh, this update will reference two required documents that must be shared with member school committees annually, the annual report and the annual financial audit report both of which are included in our materials. Uh, and we also actually have a print copy this evening as well of what I believe is the annual report. So when he gets logged in, we'll turn it over to Dr. Sawyer. Well, as uh, my screen's coming up, uh, essentially the, the document, I do appreciate uh, the quality of what uh, the collaborative has done each year in terms of its annual report. I think there's a lot of information in there that gives a sense of a lot of the programming and uh, uh, resources they provide to us um, and then as far as the uh, financial statement uh, the, the collaborative is in good health and uh, really no uh, issues that the auditor had uh, I was present at the board meeting when it was presented and uh, you know, they're very pleased with the quality of uh, you know, what, what's happening in terms of where the resources are and uh, the amount of uh, resources that are in reserve uh, is in a healthy place uh, so that uh, gives all the member districts uh, confidence that we're in a good place and they monitor that closely in terms of how you know revenue is coming in based on student enrollment in the various programs and so forth um, there's a whole variety of things that are encapsulated within and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the committee has thank you dr. Sawyer colleagues questions or comments seeing none the next item on our agenda is under the approval of minutes. We have enclosed in our meeting materials minutes of the school committee workshop held on January 16th and of our regular business meeting held on January 23rd. They have been reviewed by Mrs. Fritz, who is the committee secretary. Colleagues, on either set of minutes, do we have any questions, concerns, objections, or corrections? Seeing none without objection, those minutes are accepted. We do need to go into executive session this evening. Uh, at this time, I would entertain a motion that the school committee enter into executive session for the purpose of collective bargaining with the cafeteria workers and for the purpose of collective bargaining with the Shrewsbury Education Association, where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body, and for the purpose of reviewing, approving, and or releasing executive session minutes, and to return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. So moved. Second. This motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Motion requiring a roll call vote to pass. Dr. McGee. Aye. Mr. Wensky. Aye. Mrs. Fritz. Aye. Mrs. Kenzano. Aye. Mr. Palich. Aye. Thank you. Aye.